again, uh, Administrator Jackson. It is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce and present Tim O'Reilly. Uh, Tim is the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media Inc., thought by many to be the best computer book publisher in the world. Uh, O'Reilly Media spreads the knowledge of innovators through its books, online services, magazines, research, and conferences. They're the publisher of the iconic animal books for software developers, creator of the first commercial website, organizer of the summit meeting that gave the open software movement its name, leader in government 2.0, government as a platform efforts. O'Reilly Media continually concocts new ways to connect people with the information they need. Please join me in welcoming Tim O'Reilly. We had a momentary delay, but uh, yeah, there he is. But uh, while we'll take advantage of that delay, that's uh, there are somebody with a silver Volkswagen left their lights on. The uh, license plate six C Z L seven eight one. All right. It looks like we uh, we have a technical snafu, i.e., no support for Max. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I have my presentation in Keynote, and, and that's uh, apparently not um, something we can use. Uh, but uh, if you guys will, will bear with me, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you the talk uh, without that. Or maybe we can figure this out, if, you, if, if I can have a minute here myself. Where is the... Uh, okay, okay. Okay, so I have the connector, if that would help you. I've got it. You got it? Okay. Okay. So... Uh, here we are. Okay, so let me just, uh, while, while he's uh, working on this, uh, give you a little bit of background. How many of you know what I do? Okay, so a fair number of you. Uh, my company is a book publisher, conference producer, uh, early stage investor and the like, but what we really do is we try to pick up on faint signals from the people I call alpha geeks, uh, the people who are out there inventing the future. They're often playing with technology. They're doing things that uh, uh, make a difference. And uh, you know, they make a difference because they're, they're passionate about what they do. Anyway, what I wanted to do this morning was give you some context from that alpha geek frontier that will help you to think about where technology is going and will allow us uh, to, to understand what's important uh, in uh, the signals that we're getting from the people around us who are doing those cool things that you hear about. So when I looked at the list of critical issues for Rio Plus 20, uh, or Rio, I don't remember how you pronounce it, you're calling it Rio 2 like as in Web 2.0. Uh, uh. Anyway, I looked at the issues and uh, I saw jobs, energy, cities, food, water, oceans, disasters, and I thought, you know, these problems are of a scale and difficulty uh, that's fairly unprecedented, you know, today. We look at what's going on and we, we start to wonder, can we actually cope? And of course, there's this hope that uh, technology can help. Um, I don't know if it can, but there are a lot of people who are trying to find out. And I, what I want to do here is to help frame the big picture. Uh, Edwin Schlossberg once said, the skill of writing is to create a context in which other people can think. And it's something I've done throughout my career when I sort of tell stories about the industry, whether it's open source software or Web 2.0 or the maker movement. It's a lot about having people see the pattern. And so I'm gonna talk about something that you might not expect. I'm gonna talk about this extraordinary convergence of technology and human potential that's literally taking us towards what you could call a global brain. And the story starts in a surprising place for a sustainability conference. I'm gonna start by talking about the Google Autonomous Vehicle. How many of you guys know about this? Yeah, okay, so you heard that Google announced last year this self-driving car. But what I wanna point out is that uh, 
This is a successor to a vehicle developed here at Stanford for the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005. What most people forget is that the winner of the DARPA Grand Challenge, that vehicle there, Stanley, uh, won by going seven miles in seven hours. Okay, and then this year, six years later, Google announces that they have a car that drove hundreds of thousands of miles in ordinary traffic without a driver. Actually, I've been in the car and the driver sits there with his hands like this as the wheel turns by itself, but you know, because they're still you know, legally required to have a driver. <laughs> um, and you, you have to ask, what happened? And the first thought, of course, is that it's this huge advance in artificial intelligence. And we've seen, uh, you know, uh, this idea, you know, Jeopardy, you know, beating you know, the best human players. Uh, and we have this sense that, oh my gosh, you know, they're getting better and better at these uh, computer algorithms. And it's certainly true that there are advances. I was at the McGovern Institute for Brain Science uh, l last week and met with this guy, Tommy Poggio, who's one of the early pioneers in, in computer vision. And he's working with, uh, a genetics lab who do a lot of uh, experiments in mice, and he's working on using machine vision to detect depression in laboratory mice. You know, and you kind of go, that's just wacky out there kind of stuff that you can actually detect behavioral changes in mice using machine vision. But the fact is, it turns out it was not advances in AI that made that difference. They have pretty much the same algorithms. Peter Norvig, Google's chief scientist, said, we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data. And what happened, it turns out, was that when Google was doing their controversial street view, they were filming everything. But they were also measuring everything very, very, very precisely. So uh, as Peter said to me, it's a fairly hard AI problem to pick uh, a traffic light out of the field of view of a video camera it's a fairly trivial AI problem to figure out if it's red or green if you already know that it's there. Now, the fact is, those Google Street View drivers already drove those roads. All of that data was collected in enormous detail. They, they got uh, more data than you can imagine, and they pre-processed a lot of that. And of course, this is not all that different from what happens to a child. This is basic capability, but the child has to load the computer with all kinds of data that they can then use to process and uh, have expectations about what's going to happen uh, because the AI is a lot easier when you already have some basic expectation of what's about to happen. But this really kind of illustrates a key principle of what's going on in the world of technology today. It's that we're getting more and more data and we're able to actually call it back to mind. Now this was foreseen by one of the early pioneers of uh, computing, Vannevar Bush, who really foretold the World Wide Web and its ilk in 1945 in a famous article called As We May Think. And he talked about the ability of the mind to process information by association. And he said, well, we can't with computers duplicate this associative process, although we may be making some progress on that. But he said, you know, we can't hope to equal the speed and flexibility with which the mind follows an associative trail, but it should be possible to beat the mind decisively in regards to the permanence and clarity of the items resurrected from storage. So you see, for example, with Google, it is a, a Vannevar Bush machine, which he called the Memex, right? Where you, you, know, you search for as we may think, and guess what? Atlantic Magazine has put it online, and in two clicks, I, here I am reading this article from 1945. The, the clarity of recall with machine is far greater than the clarity of recall uh, with the human mind. So this is a kind of augmentation. He, call, he referred to it as the power of intelligence augmentation versus artificial intelligence. And so when you think about the mobile world, we're starting to have these augmentations. You know, this is a device that's an external memory that allows us to retrieve information at great speed with super clarity. And of course, it also has senses that we don't have. 
You know, so drop any of us in the middle of a strange place. We have no idea where we are, but if we have a smartphone, guess what? We do, because all of a sudden, we have augmented ourselves with a GPS sense that we didn't used to possess as humans. And so think of our devices as augmentations of humans. Think of these huge cloud databases as our extended memory, and you start to see what's happening. And of course, uh, you also see that with these mobile devices, we have an additional communication basis, uh, the ability to connect with other people who can act themselves as sensors, as actuators in this system. And so with Ushahidi, we see, for example, the ability, or frontline SMS, whatever, different ways of using that uh, phone to tie people together. So all of this is here in this story of the Google Augmented Vehicle, taken further out into the future. This car is actually an example of what you could call human computer symbiosis. Human street view drivers drove those roads. The data was measured, recorded with all these additional sensors on those street view vehicles. And then it's played back by an AI. Turns out this is also how we're getting advances in robotic surgery, for example. Uh, the, the robots watch a series of surgeons perform the surgery. They understand something about it. Oh yeah, that's the way that stitch is ought to look. And then they do it even more precisely. So that's really the third great trend, again, foretold uh, by the early pioneers of computing. Uh, JCR Licklider, who was the DARPA program manager uh, who funded TCP IP and thus ultimately the internet, wrote a, a paper in 1960 called Human Computer Symbiosis. And this was his prediction for the future of computing. He said, the hope is that in not too many years, human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly. And the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines we know today. So that's ultimately why when I coined the term Web 2.0 or started promulgating it back in 2005. I said the central fact was that these were applications for harnessing collective intelligence. And that is a really key idea as we think about solving the world's great problems. It's a key idea as we think about how do we get computers to help us to do that job. We are actually building platforms for harnessing the intelligence of all the people in the world to build an organism that's smarter than any of us individually. And it's kind of interesting, if you look at that, uh, you know, this is a routing map of the internet, and it's amazing how much it looks like maps of, of neurons. Uh, but so the assertion that I'm making is that we're building a network-mediated global mind. It's not Skynet, it's us, us augmented. And actually, back in 19, uh, sorry, 2005, uh, at my uh, Emerging Technology Conference, Jeff Bezos told a fascinating story uh, from Danny Hillis, computer scientist Danny Hillis, who said, uh, global consciousness is that thing that decided that pots containing decaffeinated coffee should be orange. <laughs> you know, and, and it's a really great way of illustrating something important. We had all these visions of, you know, sort of computers, uh, that would somehow outthink us and, you know, again, the whole Skynet vision and so on from, from the Terminator movies. And it's something much more humble. And it's something that's been happening since the very beginning of human culture. You know, language was a way of tying us mind to mind, of creating a greater organism where a village, a group, could decide on an action together, could share knowledge, could pass it down across the generations. Writing uh, took us further down that path. And now modern technology is just continuing on that path of weaving us together into a greater whole. And you see that, for example, with Twitter. You know, a new meme like uh, Occupy Wall Street, for example, came out of nowhere and it spread through means like social media. And that allows a meme in the same way that uh, you know, the orange decaffeinated coffee pot is a meme, to spread even more quickly. How long did it take for the Sanka brand color to become, uh, you know, not universal, but certainly a very widespread symbol for uh, decaffeinated coffee? Well, certainly a lot longer than it t took for Occupy Wall Street uh, to hit our consciousness. So it's speeding up. We also have simple mechanisms for sharing. So, 
you know, Wikipedia is, is old news, but it's pretty amazing if you think about it. Remember when there was the, the earthquake in Japan last year? This is the first Wikipedia page uh, that appeared. It said, uh, an earthquake occurred on 30 kilometers, 80 miles east of Sendai, Honshu, Japan. The earthquake possible to create regional tsunami on the zone. You know? and, and you watch how over uh, the next uh, you know, few weeks, it morphed through the activity of about 1,300 people who contributed five or 6,000 individual edits into a full featured page. And uh, that had all you know, better information about that disaster than anything else. And uh, this is described very wonderfully, not this particular incident, but the whole role of Wikipedia by Michael Jensen in his fantastic book, which I highly recommend to any of you. It's called Reinventing Discovery, uh, the New Era of Network Science. And it's really an exploration of how this world can help us uh, in science. But he says Wik Wikipedia is not an encyclopedia. It's a virtual city whose export to the world is it's encyclopedia articles, but with an internal life of its own. And so you find that, for example, with Wikipedia. You know, here's the talk page. There is a community behind that page, and they argue about things. And so, for example, you might have noticed that that did not say Sendai earthquake. It said Tohoku earthquake. Now, why is that? Well, because they had a big debate about it, and they said, yeah, over in the West, we call it the Sendai earthquake, but in Japan, they call it the Tohoku earthquake, and we think that that's more important. So there was a decision-making process. Michael Nielsen goes through a whole lot of examples of this. It's an amazing discussion of the uh, match that Gary uh, Kasparov said was, was the uh, greatest chess game he'd ever played. But that was before he played Deep Blue. But it's called Kasparov versus the World. Amazing analysis of how the network allowed uh, the harnessing of what uh, Nielsen calls distributed micro expertise to, you know, so that you had a crowd that actually gave the world's greatest chess player the match of his life. And uh, that's a really wonderful thing that we're all engaged in. We're building technology that will let us find some individual who knows something. The particular uh, piece on that chess game was that there was one player who'd studied a move and theorized that it had never been played in any known chess game and that it could be a really interesting move. And it came up in the game and she persuaded the, you know, the, the, uh, the 50,000 people who were participating against Kasparov to let her play that move. And you know, as, as Nielsen said, you know, Kasparov was a better player in every respect except this one. You know, that she was the world's expert on this move and its implications. And, uh, and it gave him a great deal of trouble as a result. Uh, there's one other key concept that I want to get across. And this kind of goes back to a, a statement by John Wanamaker in the 1890s. He's the sort of father of modern advertising. He was a department store magnate. And he said, half of the advertising that I do is wasted. I just don't know which half. This has become a truism in advertising. And it was true until Google revolutionized the world of advertising with pay-per-click advertising rather than paper impression. All of a sudden, you paid for results rather than simply for uh, what you showed to people. And we're still coming to grips with that in the real world. But I believe that that is one of the greatest challenges for sustainable development and for policymakers of all kinds. We have got to come to grips with the idea that we have to stop paying for what we do and instead paying for the result of what we do. And we're seeing that throughout our society. You know, there's an attempt, for example, with the Affordable Care Act here in America to start shifting our health care system to say we're going to pay for health outcomes rather than for health procedures. And uh, that shift, I think, is really critical for anybody who's interested in sustainable development. It's going to change everything. Uh, I had a backstage conversation at a, at a healthcare conference with Pascal Witz, the head of GE's uh, uh, diagnostics business. And she said, look, you know, right now, 1% of, uh, uh, of our healthcare spend is on diagnosis. And then we think we diagnose the disease, and then you spend 99% on treatment. But that's completely changing. With new sensors, we can start to detect whether a treatment is working or not. And so we have to start shifting from a model of, well, we have some idea about the problem, uh, and then we're going to spend a whole lot of money trying to fix it, to we're going to be testing constantly whether what we're doing is working. Now, you guys know that with programs in sustainable development. We're still in the old model. We have some 
crazy-ass idea. We make huge commitments to it before we even know if it's going to work, and we keep doing it. You know, and we have to shift to that model of testing, measuring, getting feedback. This, this change to feedback loops is all through the web industry. You know, the, the, there's this notion uh, called the lean startup, which is all focused on uh, you know, user testing, trying things out, and when it doesn't work, adopting. The idea of minimum viable product is what Eric Ries, the founder of the lean startup movement, calls it. He had a startup in which he, uh, he was trying to build these uh, you know, 3D avatar systems for instant messaging, and it, it failed miserably, and he, they'd spent you know, six or eight million dollars finding that out. And he, he said after they failed, they had a post-mortem, and he, he said, well, we've learned more. If, instead of supporting all 12 popular instant messaging systems, we just supported two or three? Yeah, we probably would. Wait a minute, we would have learned more if we just put up a web page advertising the product with no development at all. We would have found that nobody wanted it. <laughs> and you know that whole notion of getting quick, early engagement with as little as possible to learn as much as possible. So his, his notion is that the, the lean startup is not about how much money you spend. It's about that you understand that the goal of your startup is learning in conditions of, he says, a startup is a machine for learning in conditions of extreme uncertainty. So that's the shift. And we can really enable that with sensors. So San Francisco has introduced this new sensor-based parking system where they can start to look for an outcome. What I really love is the guys who are doing San Francisco parking. They're saying, well, our goal, it might be to maximize revenue for the city, but no, it isn't. It's actually to reduce the number of people who are circulating, creating you know, pollution, uh, you know, uh, congestion. They want to have, he said, our goal is to, is, to, is to raise the rates till there's an empty spot on every block. Right? And that's just sort of fascinating thinking that we're starting to see. And all this depends on, on something that has come to be called data science. We have a conference called Strata, which focuses on this. And, and uh, DJ Patil, uh, who was the chief data scientist at LinkedIn, wrote, wrote a wonderful little uh, booklet, which you can download for free uh, from our site or from Amazon, called Building Data Science Teams. I think that everybody in this uh, sustainable development world needs to think about data science. Um, but I want to kind of caution you a little bit. This is a wonderful visualization of, the, of this world I'm talking about. This is uh, 24 hours. This was done in Wired. It's 24 hour visualization of 311 calls. You know, people calling in saying, you know, my you know, cat's stuck in the tree. Uh, you know, there's uh, garbage cans on the street. Uh, there's illegal business use, illegal parking. You know, the condition, the, the, there's a pothole in the street. And you can kind of see it through the time of day. And it's this wonderful uh, visualization. And we're all in love with visualization. You know, we think it's so cool. But it's really important to understand that where we're headed, visualization is kind of a dead end. You know, and, and I want you to think about it back in the context of that Google autonomous vehicle. You know, right now we have this fabulous visualization that's telling us where to go. You know, we have a map. It, uh, it used to be a book. You know, it was like we'd have a, a map or an atlas and have a printed map. And then we got this interactive real-time map. But if you look out along the trend line to that Google autonomous vehicle, the visualization disappears. The visualization goes into a system that simply takes you where you want to go. And it's really important to start thinking about what we're building, not in terms of, you know, oh, it will build better systems when we do all this data analysis and it'll tell us what is happening. And start thinking about building systems that rely on feedback loops. Jeff Jonas of IBM, who's one of the really great thinkers about uh, big data, uh, you know, asked that question in an IBM commercial he did a couple, uh, two years ago, maybe. He said, would you be willing to cross the street with information that was five minutes old? Uh, <laughs> we're really moving to a, a system where we have to have this lean startup, real-time feedback loop mindset about everything we do with technology. You know, it's just kind of like, again, coming back to this notion that technology is enabling this global brain, you start saying, oh yeah, okay, it's increasingly real time. It's increasingly about getting new data from sensors which might be, uh, you know, computer uh, technical sensors, might be humans acting as sensors, and then creating quick decision loops, uh, creating quick action, you know, coordinating action and doing things collaboratively. And so 
that's really the context that I want to give you for, uh, for thinking about what you're doing. You know, the global brain is us, connected and augmented. And so then when you go out there into the exhibit hall or, uh, you know, uh, the, the, see the, the people who are here and you go, oh, I get why frontline SMS is important, right? It's this tool for connecting people into this greater whole more quickly, more real time. You know, when you look at, you know, Samosource or Crowdflower, you say, oh, yeah, this is about organizing collective work, not just to build a Wikipedia entry, but to do whatever. It's a generalized, these are generalized platforms for collective work. When we look at Instead or uh, Nextleaf, we say, oh yeah, these are actually about sensor and analytic platforms to gather data so that we can be smarter. When we look at uh, UN Global Pulse, we say, oh yeah, that's a platform for bringing all of this together. But I also don't want to um, uh, omit uh, another aspect of you know, what we learn from the internet. It's really about distributed governance. And I've been fascinated by the work of Claire Lockhart and Ashraf Ghani, who have a, a, a group called the Institute for Effective States, and uh, their book, Fixing Failed States. And one of the things that they do is they attack uh, problems from the bottom up, rather than having NGOs that kind of come in fly in, try to fix the problem. They really try to empower local people and to give them tools for governance so that they can then request help for the things that they need. And I think that kind of bottom-up uh, thinking that you see on the internet is really, really important. I also think there's a really another important lesson uh, from on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, which was the uh, famous beer for data experiment that was run by uh, Dave Warner and, and friends in Jalalabad. Basically, he felt like a lot of the NGOs were holed up in their fortified compounds, and they didn't really know what was happening on the ground. And, uh, and they weren't sharing data with each other. So he set up a bar where you paid for your beer with data. And uh, he put it up on, uh, on Google Earth, and then people say, oh my god, I'm building a school right next to your school. I didn't know that. My hospital's right next to yours. You know, it's those kind of things. So sometimes these technologies again, for making us smarter, are simply putting our data in the same place. But I want to kind of finish with kind of a few uh, thoughts about values. And I'm going to start with a picture from 1945. Vannevar Bush's article in The Atlantic created a big stir, and there was a follow-on article in Life magazine in which they drew a picture of what they imagined this information retrieval device, the Memex that you talked about, would look like. Uh, doesn't look much like Google to me. Uh, you know, it was a connection of, uh, you know, microfilm and, uh, and uh, you know, various kinds of knobs and levers to kind of get the, this, this information retrieval. We thought of the future in terms of the technology that we had in place then. And so I want you to realize that everything we're talking about, everything we're playing with today, you know, in a few years, we'll look as silly as that does to us now as our depiction of how this technology is going to work. You know, I've been spending a lot of time with my young grandson lately. And, you know, you see you know, everything in potential there. You know, and you see how he's learning. I, I see how he's learning. I see how he's engaging with the world. He has all the equipment. Uh, everything is, is there in potential. But there's a lot still to come as he grows up. But I wanted to take from that thought a notion that I heard when my own kids were growing up from a, from a teacher. And that was your job as a parent is to prepare your child for the future. And I, I want to just ask this question. If this global brain that I'm talking about is still a child, what should we be doing to prepare it for its future? Uh, and I think that predictive analytics in information applications mirrors human learning. I see all those parallels uh, between the applications we're starting to build and the way my young grandson is learning. But I also think that the algorithms and the goals we set for them mirror human vices and virtues. And so we can use this technology for good. You know, when we saw the power of social media to fight for freedom in the Middle East, we all applauded. You know, and when we see companies that have high goals for massive amounts of data, like access to all the world's information, and even despite uh, all the, the pushback against Facebook, I think Mark's really thinking hard about the future, and he's asking, how can applications be better when they're social? Uh, or my own company's motto, 
you know, changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. This is trying to set goals for this kind of collective intelligence that will raise a child that we would be proud to have as our successor. And then we also see stories you know, of how massive amounts of data were used by the financial industry to ruin the economy, extract value, not to create it. You know, we see articles about how Goldman Sachs created the food crisis by manipulating you know, food prices for profit. This is a dysfunctional teenager who has not yet figured out his moral compass. And so my question for you, you know, is as we think about where this technology is taking us, you know, the big question is how can we make the emerging global consciousness not just more powerful, more resilient, smarter, but also more moral? And that's why what you guys are doing is so important because you're focused on a future where this technology is used for good to make the world a better place and not just to enrich the people who figured out how to use it the best. But that does mean that you guys have got to take on the challenge of using technology as creatively as possible, investing in it, getting good at it faster than these guys who are trying to extract value from the system and tear it down. And that's kind of, I guess, my, my last uh, thought is um, if we are building a global consciousness, it leaves us with a problem. We've got one world, and we only have one chance to get it right. Thank you very much. Um, Tim has uh, graciously offered to stay on. I know we're running a little late, but I think that was such a, an outstanding talk and thought provocative that, that I think we should uh, have a couple of questions. So the, the floor is now open. We have roving uh, microphones down here. We have some up there as well. So uh, a couple of questions. Again, please identify yourself uh, before you offer the question. As long as they're not rovio microphones, I'll be ducking angry birds. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad pun. <laughs> uh, Jerry. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Jerry Mikulski. Um This is actually not off the tweet stream, but, but for me, which is uh, the emerging global brain, global consciousness, global mind is an emergent phenomenon, which means that it comes about in a very different way from the, thing, the way we, we used to think we could bring things about, which is command and control. Yeah. How do we um, keep it from going bad? How, we, how do we keep the Skynet scenario? There's, there's a lot of really good sci-fi out there that shows us yeah. what might happen. Uh, never mind singularitarians and other sorts of folks that, that think other yeah, things yeah. are happening. Um, how do we help structure what's going on right now or participate better in what's going on right now to uh, lead toward other outcomes? Well, I think the first uh, you know, thing I would just say is, is taking uh, this kind of technology seriously and investing in it uh, you know, in our NGO world and in, our, in the sphere of um, you know, doing good. And, and there are companies like Google that have big investments in that, in that area trying to use this technology uh, for good. Uh, but it is something of a race. I, I spoke with, uh, I, I learned through a, a channel I can't reveal recently, there's a hedge fund that's trying to build a model of the world economy, you know, that they can then use to profit, you know, from different, you know, they're, they're trying to build the biggest data mo model ever, you know, and, and it is sort of Skynet-ish, you know. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of people there who are probably, you know, they have a lot of, of money and a lot of incentive to, you know, treat this as kind of an extractive industry, just like every other extractive industry we've seen. And uh, I, I think we do it bottom up by each of us trying to uh, you know, use technology in the best way we can, you know, honoring the organizations that are doing it creatively. We are building you know, fascinating, interesting, uh, world-changing uh, technologies that do make a difference. And I think that, that those two forces are, in fact, you know, both progressing, and I, I just have, I have a lot of faith in the, uh, the bottom-up, uh, and, and I have a lot of faith in the fundamental goodness of, of people, and I guess I just I want to celebrate that uh, as much as possible, and, and I think part of what this event is about is celebrating that and getting people together who believe in that kind of future. Right here. 
Noel Dickover, State Department. Uh, how do you get developing countries to really benefit from these advanced predictive analytics? How do they take that information with virtually you know, no dollars for, for sustainable development and benefit from it to do that innovation on their scale and in their context? Well, I think one of the great things about uh, the tech industry is we do expect things to get cheaper every year. I had this great conversation with uh, uh, Reid Hoffman one time with Senator Whitehouse, and, and I, I said, we need, a, I, I happen to say, we need, a Moore's, we need Moore's Law to work in healthcare, and, and Senator Whitehouse said, what's Moore's Law? And, uh, and Reid said, well, you have to understand, Senator, that out here in Silicon Valley, we expect that every year, you know, our products aren't going to be more expensive, they're going to be less expensive, and they're going to do more. And so I do think that you know, we're already bringing immense amounts of technology to the developing world. And the people in the developing world, they're incredibly creative with that technology. They're figuring out how to get every ounce of value out of it. And so I think one of the things we need to do is to do less in the way of big, expensive programs that involve a lot of people from the, you know, the West coming in you know, with our version of it, and you know, get them as much as possible uh, the tools for them to figure out what they can build themselves from the bottom up. And I think there, are, there is a lot of great work going on in that space, but I, I think you know, we need the big organizations to honor that and, and create more of the small organizations that are actually doing it. Let's take one more. Okay, all right. Oh, wait. oh somebody, well, fighting. Okay, sorry. Tim, thanks a lot. I'm You're Benazio welcome. Masinge from Mozambique. Uh -huh. Minister of Science and Technology. Fantastic. Uh, I learned from your presentation some of the things I, I believe on. That is, the shift from process to results is not technology oriented. Yeah. It's more of the thinking, the yes. mentality. And That's most right. of the time, our graduates, our students, are framed to think in terms of process, not into the results. Yeah. Uh, when you go to the countries also, you will see that uh, the partners and uh, the locals most of the time work to the process, not yeah. results. What will be the breakthrough, yeah, in your I, opinion? Thank I, you. I, I think that's a, it's a huge shift, and the more we can support that shift, in, uh, particularly in government and in large organizations, the, the better off we'll be. It's kind of interesting. I work with, a, with an organization that's trying to bring technology to government called Code for America. They send smart uh, you know, young people in to work with city governments. And one of the most interesting comments was from somebody uh, in the city of Philadelphia where they worked with last year. They said, you showed us uh, how to do things that we already knew how to do. We just didn't give ourselves permission to do them. And I think you know, part of what we have to do is, is to create that culture change where uh, the, you know, the innovators who are in every organization are given that permission uh, to, to go for results rather than process. And, uh, you know, I don't know how you actually make that happen in any particular organization except by uh, example and by celebrating the examples that we have and by making heroes of the people who are uh, kind of drawing outside the lines to, you know, uh, make big things happen. Thank you very much, Tim. I'll be here out in the break. Yeah, we'll go out to have coffee. Tim, uh, Tim will be outside. Uh, join us for the coffee break for, for others who want to continue the conversation there. Uh, we are uh, not unusually running a little bit late, uh, so I would uh, say that if we can be back, it's 10 o'clock now in our seats by 10.20 to, uh, to begin the next session. We have a lot of fascinating speakers coming up. Thank you.